Hello, everyone. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Excellent, excellent. Hope you're enjoying the weather. <laughs> um, I'm Matt Reese. Uh, I'm uh, also joined by my partners in crime here, Zach Bullard, uh, security extraordinaire, uh, Mike Meskel, uh, mad scientist Mike, <laughs> and Justin Palmer, uh, just script it. Um, these are uh, my friends and uh, partners in uh, the OpenStack implementation. Um, I'm the lead uh, architect for our OpenStack uh, project. Um, it's good to be here, guys. Um, just honored to be here. We're lucky to be here, actually. Uh, we uh, almost didn't make it, but uh, we're here and, and glad to be here. So it's good to see all the smiling faces up here. <laughs> Um, so we are with the United States Department of Agriculture, National Information Technology Center. Uh, we are located uh, actually primarily in uh, Kansas City. Uh, we also have data centers located in um, uh, Missouri on the uh, uh, St. Louis side. Uh, we have uh, data centers actually all over the place. And um, so I'm sure you'll, if you haven't heard about us, I'm sure you will at some point. Um, so. Uh, I want to ask you, um, have you read the essay or uh, book by uh, Eric Raymond, uh, The Cathedral in the Bazaar? Um, any hands? Anybody read it? Oh, good, good. So you know what we'll be talking about here. Uh, so real quick, if you have not, um, he talks about uh, two very interesting concepts. Uh, the first one being the cathedral style. So uh, there's basically a single rigid way to do things uh, with this style. Um, he talks about writing code one way. He talks about uh, one management style, uh, primarily doing this in a silo, right? So um, basically um, also implying that uh, projects won't be as uh, successful um, perhaps. Um, also, the uh, so Linus came along and uh, he shook things up. Um, so he brought on the bizarre style. So the idea being he would uh, outsource his projects, uh, getting more participation, uh, which could also uh, result in a better product, uh, was able to get more and better releases this way, and so on. So um, that's the style that uh, we took in our OpenStack implementation, actually. Uh, I'm sure most uh, companies today are still looking at the cathedral style. Um, so trying to uh, build in the cathedral can be uh, difficult, uh, and we'll touch on that later. Um, so if you haven't read it, uh, I would recommend reading it. Uh, it's um, for all your open source junkies, um, definitely a good read. It's a little bit dry unless you're into open source stuff, so uh, go ahead and check it out. Um, so you're probably wondering, who the heck are we? Uh, so we are the enterprise data centers for the USDA. Um, a little over seven, eight years ago, um, uh, it was mandated that um, we consolidate down to two data centers, two primary data centers, like I mentioned before. Um, so we're pretty much targeting all uh, federal and state government uh, entities. Um, we uh, obviously are heavy into uh, federal data center consolidation efforts. So that's been our primary goal for a long time. So trying to uh, consolidate the USDA as a whole uh, and migrate them to two primary data centers. Um, so what we have been up to uh, historically in a slide transition here, um, his historical note, actually, uh, not sure if you knew this, but uh, Abraham Lincoln actually founded uh, the USDA in the 1860s. Uh, it's a very interesting um, fact that I actually didn't realize until I looked it up recently. Uh, Nitsi, however, came along a little later. Uh, 1957, the primary focus for years was around supporting the farm services. So I'm not sure if you uh, heard of the farm bill. But uh, that is the uh, biggest application that we had hosted for a very, very long time, uh, supporting those farmers, uh, multi-hundreds of millions of dollar project. Um, but uh, over time, the data center actually expanded and became a lot more popular. Uh, so hosting for a lot of other agencies, not just USDA, and as I have up there, uh, who we support. So we support a lot of different people, as you can tell. Uh, Department of Homeland Security, uh, Coast Guard, to name a few, 
Um, one of the biggest projects um, to mention actually is some White House related activities. So we did uh, Let's Move.gov. Uh, we've done Choose My Plate. Um, some, some of the um, websites that you've probably heard of, uh, Michelle Obama. Um, so over time we've developed um, and we uh, actually were overwhelmed with business so we couldn't uh, handle all the business that was coming down the pipe, right? Um, so total focus on the slow and steady um, for NITSI has been uh, the kind of the, the primary objective. Um, so we've uh, hosted primarily um, things on the mainframe. So we were a huge mainframe shop for years. Uh, and then eventually grew into a traditional hosting center. So we upgraded to uh, VMware platforms and uh, did some really cool things. So um, our primary focus has been uh, PaaS offerings and SaaS offerings for a long time. So uh, we started talking and, and trying to figure out what is missing here. Um, some of the things that uh, we've been talking about for a while is this IaaS service. So how do we get there? Um, so shifting customer needs, um, obviously uh, we noticed that customers' um, needs and wants started transitioning to other things. Uh, like I said, we've uh, been a mainframe shop uh, since the 90s, and yes, it is still running. Um, we need a true IaaS, um, and uh, not just SaaS, not just PaaS, but IaaS. We, uh, our ultimate goal has been to uh, empower the customer, so give them uh, what they want and um, and uh, kind of differentiate ourselves. Uh, so what we've been for a very long time is a full service gas station. Um, what customers really want, uh, things like uh, self-service gas station, right? So uh, um, they have two options basically at this point. Uh, uh, us to help them through everything uh, and then there's also um, the self-service option, so PaaS versus IaaS. This is something that we talk about all the time. Uh, some of the biggest challenges uh, are around budget, so uh, we are not appropriated. All our agencies are, they got the money, um, but their budgets have been reduced drastically. So with uh, FISMA and accreditations and all these things, they've been really um, looking for us to uh, help bring that all together. Um, so they've been after us to do PaaS mostly, but um, as we noticed, uh, things started shifting. Uh, we're not able to keep up with what they want. Um, and what they want is um, basically, um, whoop, I'm sorry, uh, Amazon, but in a government space. So um, what we do very well is um, basically um, switch to IaaS at this point. So we're looking at IaaS offerings, we're thinking about it, um, but um, we're not quite there, so there's a long path to production. Everything's pretty manual. Um, we're trying to speed things up operationally. Um, we're having issues with, with just keeping up um, with what customers need, what, what they demand. Um, so we're building new versions of VMware. We're implementing, implementing the same things over and over, just upgrading. Um, but the uh, IT business process doesn't align with what our customers need. So we're basically a uh, one-stop shop or one-size-fits-all model, um, but we need to adjust um, towards what the customer needs and wants are. So today we would like to uh, share our story um, of how we got to uh, uh, um, this OpenStack implementation uh, from the conceptual side of things to uh, the production side of things. So Zach? Would you uh, kick us off, buddy? And Thanks, Matt. Yeah. My name is Zach Bullard. I'm a security architect at the USDA's NITSE. Uh, I found OpenStack on the web late one night and uh, brought it up on break with our deputy ACIO and our ACIO. And, you know, in one of the seminars earlier today, that was something that somebody touched on was, you know, don't be afraid to approach executive management, try to you know, pitch your idea for doing private cloud. Uh, I had a 10 minute conversation with them. We talked about it and I explained basically how Rackspace and Amazon worked and, you know, we could, we could either slap cloud out in front of what we were doing with VMware or we could, you know, put together a, a real team of, of guys that, that got it and, and, and try to do something different. So they, they put together a team that we called Atmosphere and we chose that name 
because an atmosphere could contain many clouds. So we, we got a room and we booked it for like 90 days and we called that the cloud cave. And we just started researching everything we could get our hands on. OpenStack, software defined networking, vanity free hardware, uh, I mean, you name it. The, um, the POC had to be done in 90 days. So we had to build something that worked in 90 days. We had no money, not a lot of resources, and uh, it, was, it was really quite the challenge. So we scrounged together hardware, we, you know, we did what we could, and within 90 days, we, we, we got something working. So um, we, we based it on NYSERA, OpenStack, and Ceph, and getting all that to work in combination, let alone individually, was, was quite the challenge. Um, we ended up demoing it for uh, executive management and they, they really liked what they saw. So um, in the meantime, you know, we had architecture to work on. Uh, Justin had Linux to support as team lead and uh, Mike was transitioning from VMware team lead over to architecture as well. And, you know, we all had full plates. So it was, it was a little bit more of a challenge than, than I can even explain to you. So, uh, wasn't until we got deep into OpenStack that the hope kind of turned into anger and frustration. And, uh, you know, that's where Angry Stack came in at, right? So uh, I'll let Mike explain the Angry Stack part. Hi, I'm Mike Mesko. I'm network architect for USDA. And uh, I get to be the bad guy part of the presentation, right? So uh, get into trying to build this thing and uh, you know, all we've got for resources is about five guys that kind of get it. We um, diverted a blade center that was heading for the trash, and that was what we built on, which actually turned out really useful because if all of your stuff in your development environment is breaking all the time, you get really good at troubleshooting and high availability stuff. So if you've got some real junky stuff, put it in the lab. It actually helps. Um, so we started digging into this thing, started building it. And we, for our POC, we wanted to do a, uh, a fulsome build, get uh, NYSERA NVP, which is now VMware NSX, in there, because we really wanted to kill the VLAN thing. Over in our you know, managed hosting setup, we call it death by VLAN. Every customer that comes in has to be provisioned a bunch of VLANs, and there's all this confusion about who's got what and where stuff's supposed to be deployed to. We wanted to be able to put that in front of the customer and let them do it. There are a bunch of other benefits to the SDN piece, but that was our, our main thing. Uh, so as we start to get into building this and start to look at what components do we want and uh, how do we want to do Cinder? What do we want to put behind it? What do we want to put behind Glance? You know, We start seeing that everything in the docs leads up to a certain point, and then we see this next patch is coming that has this awesome feature, and we see the next thing coming along, we're like, oh, we need that, right? And so it seems it's always the case that there's some business problem or some customer service problem that's it's always solved in the next release because everybody's got the same problems we have. And luckily, there's somebody coding against those problems. But I always have a current problem. So this was pretty much the most fun I've ever had at work was building this. So start Googling like crazy, right, trying to make stuff work. Um, our initial strategy was that we knew since we all had day jobs, basically, in addition to doing this thing, we had to cut down our communication time between people. So round everybody up, stick them in a, uh, in a conference room that used to be an office and then used to be a training room and then became a conference room again. The, uh, Don't go in there during the summertime. Yeah, the ventilation's stinky. not right in there. Apologize to anybody that ever goes in there. So uh, while we're in here in the sticky room, you know, we start learning Agile, have a really good Scrum Master to start out, and it's stickies all over the walls, right? There's your stories, there's your backlog, all that stuff. Um, there's whiteboards on all four walls of that room, and then we bought one with wheels on it, because we needed to have a lot of whiteboard time to figure out what we were doing. Uh, but having the whole team in, room, in one room was critical. I know everybody's really into distributed groups and you know people all over the country stuff, but the communication time of a guy across the desk from you is very short. Um, so we started talking to some vendors. And uh, 
one of the vendors right on the phone, flat out, when we tell them what we want to do and how much time we have, literally told us we were crazy and it couldn't be done. So that really encouraged us. Now nope, we nobody, really had to make it happen. Nobody right? that's in here, though. No. Um, so when we first set out, we kind of tried to divide and conquer. Like, OK, Zach, you take Glance. And Justin, you take Nova. I'll take Cinder. You know, we'll give Matt Quantum, now Neutron. And um, that doesn't work. You can't go and kind of hover over one thing and work on it and try to get it done and then sync back up later. So we found about 500 ways not to build OpenStack and uh, iterated real fast. And when something didn't work, we just trashed it. Just start over, do it right, take some notes, <coughs> try it again. Um, eventually, we kind of developed a, a method where we just threw the projector on the wall and at least two, if not three people are looking at it, at every command going in, every config file change. And so it was kind of like extreme programming for configuration files, right? But mistakes were reduced. If you make a mistake in Keystone, game over, right? It's not fixable. You're gonna have to go fix and rebuild Keystone to get it straightened out, at least back in the Folsom days, probably easier now. So we get to where some stuff's working, some stuff isn't, and then some stuff that was working stopped working. And so the, uh, the wall there is the tech debt as uh, post-it after post-it starts flying to the wall and start to get kind of depressed. Uh, but then, you know, you have the, the upside. Everybody concentrates on what's in the tech debt to fix it. And you wind up with, okay, Glance is fixed now. Now it works. And that's a huge victory. And we got to the point where these victories were hard fought enough that we start clapping every time somebody comes into Scrum and says, this is fixed, this works. Check out the log, it's not filling a gig an hour anymore. It's, you know, images are going in and out of glance as an we example. We just needed a little motivation to keep going. Right. And so the Atmos clap comes up. So then we get to about two thirds of the way through. And uh, we finally got enough We've learned enough about OpenStack to get a cluster built and working, and we're starting to do our uh, NYSERA MVP to quantum integration. And uh, NYSERA was a huge support on this. They had a, uh, an amazing engineer that was just, he built an environment just like ours and started hacking through the exact same OS, same packages, all of this stuff. And so we're about two days behind this guy. You know, we would call him up for the next day's meeting and say, hey, I got to this and security groups are jacked up. And he says, oh, yeah, I ran into that. Here's the code I wrote. Here's a little doc on how to get it in there. Okay, well, I know what I'm doing for the rest of the day, right? And so talk to him the next day, get the next piece. Eventually got that working and we we're starting to get pretty happy about this thing. So I'm gonna let Justin take over for the, for the actual, the fun, the fun ends and things are actually working now. All right, <clears throat> awesome stack. So at uh, this part in our project, uh, you know, we actually have something working. Uh, you know, our main feature being uh, deploying VMs without errors. Uh, very exciting for us um, through the Horizon interface, which, uh, you know, we had some challenges with. Um, as Mike said, uh, you know, we finally got, uh, you know, a later plug in from NYSERA, uh, and we start seeing the awesomeness of, you know, what SDN can provide us. Um, you know, we, you know, we're on the verge of getting rid of VLANs. Uh, we could see customers can be empowered to create their own networks, routers, uh, firewalls, et cetera. It was very exciting. And uh, along the way, you know, we made, you know, some additions. So um, if you ever use any enterprise IT software or any software in general, uh, you know, there's always things that uh, don't work as well as they should, or there's a feature there that you don't have. Uh, and so one of the reasons we chose OpenStack in the first place uh, was to be able to extend it in the, you know, the way that you would expect to. Uh, OpenStack being, you know, open source, uh, written in an approachable language, uh, we were very excited about this. And one of the challenges we took early on uh, was our uh, version of Horizon lacked the ability to boot from volume. These features were available in the CLI and the API, of course, uh, but we felt like in order to put on a true demo to the executive staff, that we really needed to do it uh, the way a customer would, and that's through the web interface. Um, so we dove into uh, 
the Django code and uh, put a working piece in there. Uh, we also um, took a look at the instance deployment uh, workflow. Uh, we felt it really wasn't as intuitive as uh, we would like our customers uh, to be. So uh, we tore all that out and you know put in a step-by-step, -step, ask you questions, you put in answers uh, at the end, a uh, VM just like you wanted it. Uh, additionally, uh, the monitoring. Uh, now we're all um, either former system admins or current system admins, and so uh, we knew a ton about monitoring and could, could easily have punted here and chose a traditional monitoring product like Nagios or something. Uh, but since you know we felt like uh, we've already done all these extensions, we wanted to bring it you know closer into the environment and actually you know make a dashboard uh, that had host health on it. Uh, monitored the Ceph bit. Um, that turned out to be a lot more complicated as we wrote both, you know, clients for the hypervisor as a server, exposed an API that, you know, Horizon was able to get to. Um, so that was exciting for us. Um, this last piece, uh, Atmos Monkey, um, is a project uh, we started early on. Uh, we wanted to be able to continuously test uh, OpenStack. And so we wrote a uh, project that would continuously do all the things that a user would do. Um, create VMs, create users, uh, create volumes, routers, networks, everything, uh, and test them end to end and notify us of any problems. Because one of the things we ran into as we um, changed configurations, extended uh, horizon, is things would break and we really wouldn't know about it because we're not constantly you know, exercising the product. And so you know, we, we wrote a thing. Um, now with the uh, you know the Tempest project, I mean we're totally going to uh, scrap our implementation and just use that you know with all the scenario-based tests. I mean that's those guys have done fantastic work there, so we're just going to take that and run. All right, so um, here we are, uh, end of our 90 days uh, demo day. We're invited up to the um, executive conference room. Um, now, like any presentation, you're going to have some last minute problems. Ours was a security group error. Uh, whenever we create a security group through Horizon, a scary uh, red message would flash across the screen. Uh, of course, everything would, would work, but you would still get this you know, ominous error. Uh, so we, uh, we had to tell the, uh, whoever's driving the presentation to be ready and you know, hit a quick F5 on that so we could hopefully uh, avoid any embarrassment. So uh, after we, you know, spun up a, a bunch of VMs to prove this thing was all working and, you know, what a customer would see, you know, we, we wanted to give a, kind of a deep dive into uh, Ceph because um, we really viewed that as, you know, a future platform that not only for VMs but other parts of the organization. Um, so we wanted to impart on them, you know, how impressed we were with the, with the product, uh, not only through our um, terrible uh, blade center, um, hardware failures, uh, but configuration changes, you know, us just not knowing what we were doing. The thing, you know, performed, you know, fantastically. So kudos to those Ink Tank guys. That's an amazing product. So, all right, uh, everything was a success, beyond impressed. Um, and so uh, what the organization kind of realized is this OpenStack thing may be our future. Um, so we wanted to, you know, go out and socialize that with the group and uh, let's build a production thing. Uh, but of course, like any government organization, we actually have no money. So there's no R&D and we need to find a way to pay for it before we can actually start. Uh, so this begins the uh, long process of, you know, taking this POC, demoing it to all of our largest customers who have problems that we think are solved with this new way of, uh, um, deploying IaaS and so um, luckily we found such a customer who was willing to put money in advance and kind of buy the dream. Uh, so like any big change or any product rollout in an organization you know not everybody is you know open arms and pats on the back you know we had some concerns uh, with some of the internal groups uh, there were f you know finance concerns whether this thing it was going to be so cheap uh, to sell that was really, you know, potentially going to cause revenue problems. We had, uh, you know, uh, operational concerns uh, with some groups that um, uh, this thing was going to let customers uh, do for themselves what they had previously paid us to do. Uh, so we had a lot of meetings with groups and, you know, kind of talked about uh, 
how are we going to do things, you know, in the future? You know, how we split models up into, you know, professional services and sell add-ons and not just have everything baked into, you know, the traditional thing we have right now. So with that, I'm going to hand it back to Matt. He's going to talk about uh, what we ended up with. Yeah, I'll just tell you when to flip the slide. Oh, okay. That works too. <clears throat> so, yeah, solution to stack. So uh, what we ended up doing was um, writing on our whiteboard world-class cloud. So that was our goal every day. We would walk in and, and think about uh, world-class, um, and we would not settle for anything less than that. Um, so we've been doing all these crazy things, right? So we've been uh, Googling things. We've been building things. We've been adding and destroying and all these things, uh, going back and forth and destroying the, the stack and rebuilding and all these things. So we're trying to figure out what do we need to do to become world-class, stable, sustainable? Um, so um, we're not able to hire like a rack space. So what uh, we meant there is uh, we're not able to just go hire 1,500 people and let them go nuts with it, right? So uh, we basically had five guys and a, a stack of servers um, to do our development and uh, build this thing. So. Um, trying to figure out how are we going to actually do this thing. Um, and uh, so look for companies that understand our vision. So we were looking around. We read some things. Um, we saw that there were some cool companies doing some cool things. We, uh, of course, uh, talked to some of the uh, founding members of OpenStack and, and trying to really dig in and, and see where we needed to head. Uh, some of the things that um, government entities, of course, are, are really – um, strict on is 24-7 uh, support. So we need to be able to rely on other people outside of our organization. What if we just, you know, picked up and left or something we run over by a bus or something like that. So they want somebody that's going to integrate with them uh, very, very well, have that level of stability behind them. Um, things that we uh, are also looking to do is uh, uh, plan for FedRAMP. So we are uh, FedRAMP. Uh, well, we have the FedRAMP provisional agency. agency. We are the first in the government to get FedRAMP, so. Yeah, so. Uh, it's a risk authorization management program. It's basically an off-ramp for IT to go to the cloud, uh, like Amazon, Rackspace. Yeah, so we are the first government entity to do that. Uh, as you will see, the list is growing. Um, a lot have it now. Um, so. That is uh, motivation for us to uh, continue our development efforts. So moving on here. Uh, oh, there you go. Perfect. This is what this guy does every single night. You may want to uh, take, take, uh, take the night off tonight. I don't know. I was hoping so. <laughs> so these are 853 controls. So this is something that Zach embeds himself in daily. Um, unfortunately, he comes in and he gets angry because he has to read so many of these things. And he... Uh, I don't know where, where you left off right now. Did you uh, submit or? Uh, we have 95% we have of our controls written for, uh, for this. So uh, we'll be submitting here pretty soon. And this is 853 Rev4. So we're at Rev3 now. Rev4 has to be implemented here soon. But I mean, this is, this is the building blocks for security uh, in the government right now. So this is what FISMA is based on. Are we able to feel anymore? Like, <laughs> He, he needs lots of hugs. We gave him hugs. Lawyers shouldn't write nerd descriptions, right? I mean, <laughs> nerds should write this stuff, not lawyers. And yeah. that's what kills it for you. Exactly. I sympathize. We'll hug after. Yeah, yeah. So moving on, um, we continue to think about operationalizing. So we've been doing lots of research, like I was mentioning. Um, some of the things we liked uh, um, in our research is provisioning that Piston uh, was doing. So every service on every single node, right? So design for failure. So um, if a host fails, no big deal. Um, we are impressed by their operational philosophy. So uh, being able to integrate with them uh, would be a, a plus, right? So. Uh, being able to have that support method in place. Um, another uh, uh, partner in this uh, is VMware NSX. So the maturity behind their software-defined networking uh, components uh, were bar none the, the best that we've seen so far. Uh, there's a lot that are coming along. 
Uh, we continue to uh, do research on a variety of different ones, but um, they are definitely uh, the leading uh, SDM providers at this point. Uh, and we successfully uh, implemented that. Um, and like we mentioned, uh, we are on the heels of turning ours live. Uh, so I think we're about uh, 60 days out from actually lighting that sucker up and, and officially declaring it production. Um, so also the troubleshooting shooting capabilities within NSX are unbelievable. I don't know if you had a chance to uh, see any demos out there or go check out what they got going, but I would definitely recommend doing that. Yeah, those troubleshooting capabilities really helped us get it built. We, uh, when you have an interface and you're trying to figure out why this VM can't talk to this router port or why this VM can't talk to this other VM, you go into the, the NSX manager web page you go in there and you choose which two ports you're talking about and you hit go and it will go down through the entire stack of all your SDN stuff and the controllers and the service nodes and which hypervisors and all this stuff and see which ones can talk to each other and which direction. As we were building the thing out, we ran into problems where we had messed up something and opened vSwitch on one of our hypervisors and got it right on the other ones. And you go and do that and you're trying to solve the question of, how come the VM can ping its gateway when it's on this box, but if I move it to this other one, it can't? And you hit the troubleshooting wizard there, and you just see this hypervisor, it's receiving packets this direction, but the packets aren't coming back this other direction. You know exactly where to go troubleshoot, and then you can you know, blame your buddy who last touched the config file. <laughs> So we do have this stood up and working, and if anybody is interested in seeing some things behind the scenes, we're more than willing to show, so let us know. Um, the silicon mechanics piece is another uh, vital part for us. Uh, uh, so the amazing fulfillment part is um, whole rack increments. So their philosophy is, is we build whole rack um, worth of servers, whole rack worth of cabling, uh, switch gear, everything all wrapped up and uh, bundled up. Uh, they deploy uh, piston um, and they ship it to us. So it hits our dock and all we have to do is wheel that sucker in, put it in place, power it up, and away we go and we got a cloud built um, in a matter of hopefully days rather than months. Um, obviously the first time around, uh, we work through all the issues, so hopefully the next uh, bundle that we uh, that we order um, will actually go smoother. But um, that's just uh, internal uh, related issues. That's not uh, vendor related issues. <laughs> so that's us fighting with trying to get power in place. I don't know if anybody is from the government around it's here fighting with the silos. Yeah, exactly. So the question that uh, we get down to is how do we get this to happen so get what we want what we ended up doing is talking to all these guys and saying hey come to kansas city and have some barbecue so we can pick your brains and uh even josh mckinty came out and uh he tweeted uh, lunch in kansas meat is not optional <laughs> so if you come hang with us you're going to be eating a ton of barbecue so if you want to come out and take a look at what we got uh, please do. Uh, we'll definitely stuff your faces full of uh, Oklahoma Joes or something like that. Uh, but anyway, thank you very much. Um, questions, we're open for anything. So throw anything at us. Uh, we're willing to answer anything. Uh, I don't know if there's anything we have to keep off the table here. Yeah, let's try not to talk about NIST or FISMA. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions? We, we don't want to replace. We, we, PAS is a, in the government, it's a special thing because we, we have to retain full control up through the, the operating system layer. We wanted to provide an infrastructure as a service with, with new abstraction layers that provided you know, a greater span of control for the customer. And that's what we saw in OpenStack, and that's really what the hope was. So what we were having with our VMware managed hosting setup is the one size fits all problem. There's some customers that go into that and they don't have a Zach. They don't wanna do all the security controls and all that super tedious and boring patching and certification and audits. They wanna inherit that from us. And for us, we become really good at that because we're gonna do it for thousands of machines. But you're also forcing customers in there that have a huge IT org and are really quite good at this already. So they come in there and they're just super frustrated. Their, their first question is, what's the root password? And then it's a meeting schedule to explain to them 
how they can't inherit the controls if we give them root. And so those guys really need an alternative. They need a true IaaS where they can bring their huge, very well-developed IT organization that can already fend for themselves and satisfy their goal of going into a consolidated enterprise data center and get you know their boss cubed off their back about why is this computer closet still running. And FedRAMP really kind of puts a target on hosting centers like us in the government space because its sole purpose is really to authorize government to go to Rackspace, go to Amazon, and uh, we feel that you know there's just some systems that need to be behind government walls. So. Yes. Very. And do you consider that competition then? Sure. Yes, absolutely. Welcome competition. It can be a compliment as well. I mean, uh, there's going to be hybrid scenarios in the future where you may want to have a portion of your, your multi-tier app that's, that's there, and the other, uh, the other tiers are in my data center. So. Are you looking for interoperability between the two? We're looking for whatever our customers want. So a uh, hybrid scenario may be something that they want in the future. Um, right now, I think it's just to have more empowerment. You know, with data center consolidation, um, one of the things, you know, we've all migrated systems here in, in support of that, that program. And one of the things you're doing is you're taking power away from ultimately your customers and you're forcing them into processes that they didn't write or necessarily consent to. And so it's empowerment is what we wanted to give back to them. That's what we kind of found with OpenStack. Looks like we've got about five minutes left. Let's go on to the next question. Oh, my question was similar. Like, I was just wondering uh, if you could like describe what sort of what your three main benefits were over doing OpenStack rather than like public cloud providers. So there's one of those. I hate to say this, but government regulation, right? So if you've got some uh, some application that has to do with a lot of personally identifiable information, like social security numbers, things related to the farm bill, and uh, monetary authorizations related to farm bill and stuff like that. I don't think we're at a point where that stuff's really appropriate for a public cloud provider. Now, if it's the USDA.gov website, sure, there's nothing scary there. And, you know, those guys that run that can make a decision. So we wanted to have an alternative that's public cloud provider like, but still within the government regulations, still, you know, government employees and, and government contractors with all their background checks and all that stuff you know, still doing the work. Um, another benefit for it was that when we moved away from trying to bolt something on the front of a large VMware setup and start to kind of mix this PaaS thing and then put IaaS that self-service into there and move toward OpenStack, the, the pricing starts to align much better with what the public providers are able to offer even when we're not at their gigantic scale. And that's who we're being compared with, too. So, I mean, customers would come to us, why can't you do this? Amazon does it. Why can't you do that? Rackspace does it. They'd quote the five tenants of cloud and, you know, demand agility and elasticity. And we can't do that with COTS. We have to, we have to build it. And I'd say probably the final large benefit is that we could further tailor OpenStack to our specific mission or our customer's mission. You know, when we get out of the one size fits all, we can do a lot more for the customers if they want something different in Horizon, we can get that for them. So I don't know whether you've seen the latest uh, or the most recent DHS uh, RFI, and they explained the ECS2, how they're going to build that framework around a hybrid solution. So what I'm seeing in the agencies or most agencies within the federal government is that everyone's trying to sell services to everyone else. It seems like a, a race to whoever can be there first with a hybrid solution to sell brokerage of services um, is going to win the battle. A, a DHS uh, described in their RFI that they want to sell services, DOD, federal agencies, uh, federal contractors, and consumers. Um, I actually did some uh, reference architecture for a uh, partner that um, I would worked with around uh, describing what that would look like um, overall from a hybrid standpoint. So I guess my question is, do you guys see that you have to position yourself in competition with the other agencies? And is there some way that you're looking at covering certain services versus what DHS would cover? And obviously DHS from an intelligence agency standpoint. 
So I would say that right now we're in pretty direct competition and trying to outdevelop each other, right? Even we might wind up using the same products. What I'd really love to see is the hybrid cloud model becomes an option of I put some of my stuff at USDA, maybe I put some of my stuff at DHS's cloud, maybe I put some of my stuff at Amazon and move them around as needed, you know, by business needs. <coughs> There's a lot of room. There's a lot of computers in the government and more of them show up every day. Right? Yeah, so we've been we've been recruited also to build on site. So a lot of these guys that we're doing demos for now and asking for all the services you're talking about um, actually want them on prem as well. So I don't know if you've seen that. Yeah, I, I, DC1, DC2, they, I mean, they're already talking about co uh, consolidating and then also having a single sign one to get access to their conventional. That was going to be my point was that yeah. data center consolidation, which is a mandate, yeah. right? That comes at a very high level. That's going to force cooperation at some point. Once once the week have been weeded out and the, the redundant data centers and the closets and all that thing, we're, we're, it's going to force cooperation at some point. Yeah, my last question is a quick question. Um, with all these mainframes, did, were you tempted to run uh, OpenStack on their ZVM? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> Good one. All right. Uh, I guess we're at the end of our time. So uh, if you have any more questions, we'll be out in the hall there. Uh, we're welcome to talk or do whatever. So come on over and talk to us. Thanks. Thank, Thank you, you very much for attending.